Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Kate Osterley, and I'm a part of the marketing team here at Genomenon. On behalf of our whole team, we thank you for joining us. We have a lot of great information to share with you today, so I will get right to housekeeping and introductions. You can submit questions via the chat um, on the lower right-hand side of the window. Please send us your questions, and I will field those to Dr. Keel as we go along, and we'll also take time to answer more at the end. We will be recording today's webinar, and we'll share links with the recording as well as the Q&A transcription with all of you via an email. Today's webinar, Using Genomics to Accelerate Drug Development for Neurodegenerative Diseases, will be hosted by Dr. Mark Keel, and I'll introduce him now. Mark completed his MD, PhD, and Molecular Genetic Pathology Fellowship at the University of Michigan where his research focused on stem cell biology, genomic profiling of hematopoietic malignancies, and clinical bioinformatics. He is the founder and chief science officer of Genomenon, where he su supervises the scientific direction of the mastermind suite of software tools. Mark, take it away. Thank you, Kate, and uh, hello, and welcome to all the attendees. We've got a pretty diverse collection of people, so my intention with this webinar is to keep things pretty high level, but I, as Kate mentioned, welcome questions throughout the presentation as well as after uh, through email or um, uh, various ways that you can contact us through the website. So again, very happy to have everybody here, uh, even under the, the present circumstances. It's actually very encouraging to see how this enforced distance is bringing a lot of people together, particularly my colleagues in, in the medical field and our, our colleagues in pharma, uniting together for a common cause. Uh, during these challenging times when many of uh, the laboratory work is shut down and manufacturing has, has come to a halt, um, there, there's ways to continue maintaining the momentum that the data science teams at these uh, institutions have been making by um, looking at more of the in silico data, which is what is going to be the substance of the webinar today. So I'm gonna turn off the, the uh, video here so that you can focus on the slides. And I'll, I'll begin uh, with an outline of the, the presentation for today. So the first component of the webinar is to discuss why genomics is important in drug discovery and drug delivery. I'll talk about the core benefits and applications of genomics generically. And then more specifically, in the second part of the webinar, I'll talk about how you should go about leveraging genetics and genomics through the use of Mastermind's comprehensive genomic landscapes. I'll describe what genomic landscapes are, as well as the many places where they're applicable, again, at a very high level. But then the last part and, and the most substantial part of the conversation will be revolving around some specific use case examples, representative case studies that we've developed in concert with a number of our pharma clients, all revolving around neurodegenerative disease. So before I begin with the, the core of the webinar, let me emphasize that what I describe here is only representative but is not uh, limited to just the neurodegenerative diseases specifically that I talk about or neurodegenerative disease at all. We've done a number of projects in oncology and rare disease. Uh, the focus of today's webinar is just a coalescence of the information that we've accumulated around a number of neurodegenerative projects uh, that we've put together with our clients. So let's start by talking about the core benefits and applications of genomics in drug discovery. This is a major takeaway uh, from the talk here. We'll get into some more detail. This is not just true, obviously, of the work that Genomenon is doing, but it's, it's known throughout pharma and has been for some years that having genetic information supporting the candidacy of your targeted uh, molecules, biomarkers and the like, can double the likely success of a drug bringing it to bear in the clinic. So this is one of the more um, seminal papers that talked on about this is from Nature Genetics some years ago, but there've been another, uh, sorry, a number of additional papers, uh, both review articles and primary studies that have corroborated this notion 
uh, and, and why we're gathered here today. So the promise of genomics in drug discovery, I've broken down into three subcategories. One is that it's useful for reconciling information about the pathogenicity of complex or heterogeneous diseases, both in, in interrogating the mechanism of action, whether they be activating or loss of function, or in resolving uh, clinical heterogeneity. It's also true that it can bring multiple seemingly disparate disease types together, which may have a unified mechanism of pathogenicity, which therefore could be co uh, considered to have a unified treatment approach. And then lastly, um, many conditions that are genetic have either known or unknown underlying genetic heterogeneity, the, the different pathways that are involved to arrive at seemingly identical clinical circumstances would, if they have different paths genetically to get to those clinical circumstances, would obviously have a different drug response profile and, and genomics can resolve that heterogeneity. And the opposite side of that coin is that pathway homogeneity can be uncovered by genomics, linking patient subtypes within a defined clinical entity that was, other, was otherwise unknown or unknowable, absent genetic information that can, can um, predictively determine which patients are going to have which course, either in uh, the natural history of the disease or in response to a targeted therapy. So that's broad strokes where the promise of genomics lies in drug discovery. More specifically, uh, as we have seen in our, our work with a number of our pharma partners, where genomics can empower pharma is in optimizing preclinical therapeutic targets at the beginning phase of, of triage and understanding which targets are vulnerable to uh, drug ability. Further, it can reduce R&D costs to streamline those candidate predictions, as well as devising experiments that are maximally efficient to lead to a successfully targeted biomarker with a, a molecule or a library of molecules. Likewise, on the other side of the, the drug discovery process, understanding the genomics of a disease can maximize the success of clinical trials by better parsing patient populations with known genetic drivers of disease which are known to be targeted by the therapy that's um, uh, the, the uh, central focus of the clinical trial. And then um, uh, similarly on that end of this, the drug discovery pipeline, if expediting FDA approval by having this great burden of genetic evidence with all of its evidence citations, as I'll describe when I characterize what a comprehensive genomic landscape is, can materially um, uh, speed the time to market by oftentimes eliminating the need for a, a, a resubmission of an initial FDA application because of the strength of the initial application and all of the data and evidence and ballast underpinning that first submission. And we've seen that play out with a number of our, our pharma partners. So that's great. What's the problem? What's the problem that we're, we're, we're discussing the solution for? Well, it's assembling these comprehensive genomic landscapes, the, this full understanding of the genomic underpinnings of a disease and how treatment may be brought to bear to, to treat patients with those different mutations is extremely challenging to aggregate and annotate and understand using only a manual approach. So, Particularly valuable is the information that's otherwise locked away in the scientific research. A manual approach to extracting this information is incomplete and intractable due to the time it takes to collect all that information. So at Genomenon, we've solved that problem for our clinical users with the Mastermind Genomic Search Engine, which has all of the collected evidence from the medical literature pre-aggregated and readily searchable. And for our pharma clients, we've leveraged the intrinsic association data within Mastermind linking diseases and phenotypes and drugs 
with genes and variants, no matter how any one of those entities is described in any of the, the published literature or supporting databases necessary to fully understand the, the, the genomic landscape of a disease. In keeping with the way that the clinical world interprets the meaningfulness of genetic variants, we also incorporate predictive models of protein consequence, as well as population frequency, and layer that information on top of all the evidence from the empirical literature that's uh, uh, contained within the mastermind database, and bring that to bear to produce what we've called a comprehensive genomic landscape. So what is a comprehensive genomic landscape? It's a complete data set of all genetic variants for any given gene or gene pathway or drug target, or any disease indication or phenotype or biological phenomena extracted from the mastermind database, which is, as I mentioned, extremely exhaustive and up-to-date, and then having that information be expertly curated by Genomenon's team of variant scientists uh, and uh, scientific researchers using all of that evidence from the mastermind database to drive the scientific conclusions and assertions that are made. So more specifically, the variants are interpreted according to clinically accepted standards, the ACMG in the case of constitutional disease and AMP in the case of oncology. And all of the information, all of the assertions that we make in promulgating these comprehensive genomic landscapes are fully referenced. That includes clinical studies and findings, empirical functional studies that get at mechanism of action, which will be a major focus of the examples that I show, as well as obviously treatment information and clinical trial information. And critically, all of that is supported by scientific evidence in the form of references to the primary uh, text from which those findings were, were extracted. That information, as, as vast as it is, is all summarized very efficiently so that a researcher in pharma on one end of the drug discovery pipeline or uh, uh, a group running a clinical trial, a CRO or an internal team on the other end, can have walk away immediate, immediately actionable insight into what this comprehensive genomic landscape means holistically for the gene or the, uh, the gene pathway that um, was the substance of the, the comprehensive genomic landscape or specifically as you're investigating any one of those individual variants or their associated data. And then uh, obviously it's updated quarterly with any new findings that are newly published because the research world doesn't slow. And in fact, in genomics, the, the pace of acceleration uh, has quickened since uh, the commoditization of these sequencing platforms and their use in, in research studies, uh, both clinical and basic biological studies. So I've alluded to the drug discovery uh, pipeline. This is uh, likely to be very familiar to uh, my attendees. Uh, Mastermind's comprehensive genomic landscapes that are produced by Genomenon's team are helpful and critical in many aspects across multiple stages of the, the pharma life cycle, from early discovery and divining what molecular drivers there may be uh, uh, causing this disease, all the way to patient segregation and developing a market for a new compound, up to and including commercial and post-commercial activities, such as I talked about with development of a companion diagnostic and uh, appropriate regulatory support, or as we're increasingly finding in challenging uh, rare disease cases, helping pharma companies to identify the patient populations that would benefit Fit from their drug, of which by definition, there are few patients. Mastermind, uh, with its reach into the clinical realm and molecular diagnosticians and treating physicians in that respect, can bridge that gap and help streamline the process and maximize the yield of patient identification in rare disease. So what makes Genomenon unique, I think, is our, our combination of very sophisticated and, and genomically aware computational intelligence that exhaustively and accurately indexes the vast corpus of information that we've accumulated over the past seven years of operation. Layered on top of that 
our expert curation. So as I, as I alluded to before, every one of our assertions that we make in a comprehensive genomic landscape is vetted manually by one of our variant scientists and, and ultimately approved by uh, an MD or an MD PhD level review. So um, it's not the situation that it's um, all produced from an AI or machine learning approach where you have reason to be suspicious of the quality of that information. But moreover, it's not only produced manually, which has the challenge of being insensitive and, and very liable to missing information, as I'll showcase in some of the use cases, as well as uh, the, the challenges associated with revisiting that data if you would need to go back and do that investigation again from the bottom up manually. So again, Genomenon's unique approach is the, the uh, integrated combination of computational intelligence and, and final expert manual curation. So the, the uh, latter half of the talk, I'm going to, as promised, want to focus on neurodegenerative disease with, I think, um, four or five case examples that, that are born out of work that we have done with pharma or um, biotech companies interested in developing therapeutic compounds for neurodegenerative disease who were aware that they would greatly benefit from understanding the comprehensive genomic landscape of that disease for particular genes. So the first example I'm going to go through is Parkinson's disease. And there are two genes uh, that I wanted to talk about, although there's a, 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 about a dozen or more genes that are known to be associated with Parkinson's. Some of the more prevalent genes um, that are widely known to lead to Parkinson's disease are GBA and MR2. Parkinson's disease, as, as uh, likely we, we all know, affects nearly a million people in the United States and leads to motor symptoms such as tremor and bradykinesia, as well as non-motor symptoms such as depression and, and sleep disturbance. And it results from loss of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra and an accumulation of SNCA aggregates, either through direct uh, uh, mutation of that gene or upstream uh, mutations, as we'll talk about. And importantly, and why I think there's been a focus on Parkinson's uh, from a number of our, our pharma colleagues, is that there's no real efficacious therapeutic options for Parkinson's disease, at least not th that are widely disseminated. And, and currently, uh, the patients are managed with uh, symptomatic relief only. And 90 to 95% of patients uh, are sporadic, although caused by uh, genetic mutation. Um, and, and many familial cases exist, such as in genes uh, like SNCA. In addition, there's many risk alleles that are associated with Parkinson's, but the genes that I want to talk about uh, have a, a high genotype to phenotype correlation. And the one I want to begin with is GBA, which is a gene uh, better known as beta glucocerebrosidase, which is active in lysozymes, uh, lysosomes, and it cleaves uh, a component of cell membranes. And it is known to cause both Parkinson's disease as well as a metabolic disorder called Gaucher's disease, which uh, comprises three distinct subtypes depending on the presence or absence of neurological complications. And a particular area of focus for the, the group that we were working with on this project was reconciling those different subtypes of Gaucher's disease and thinking about how that the genetic mechanism of development of disease through mutations in GBA is related to those patients who develop Parkinson's because of mutations in GBA. So they were particularly focused in two aspects of this gene. One is in obviously understanding the full breadth of genetic mutation that contribute to disease, but secondly, understanding uh, both the functional mechanism of disease causation, as well as the disease speciation at the hand of different types of variants that may lead to the genetic heterogeneity that leads to uh, um, uh, different clinical uh, findings in, in different patients. So to top line it, or to, to give you a walk away yield from, from the work that we did, the group that we were working with began with an awareness of about 30 some mutations that they had, or variants that they had accumulated through uh, a year or more of 
their manual review of the scientific literature. They were aware that they were likely to be missing information, and that's why initially they came to Genomenon. But in addition to producing our comprehensive genomic landscape, we also revisited the three dozen variants that they began thinking were associated with disease and brought clarity to those variants and, and the group's understanding of what those variants did by having a deeper and more broad reach into all of the evidence supporting or detracting from the candidacy of those variants. So in total, at the end of this, we, we produced a data set that comprised about 300 pathogenic variants in the GVA gene out of a total of, I think, some six or 700 variants that were described at all in the medical literature. So 300 with clinical grade evidence to support their pathogenicity, including about a third of those, which had functional studies, either in vitro or in vivo functional studies, divining the protein consequences of those individual variants, which is again, what uh, uh, half of the goal of the, the work that we undertook was designed around. So in total, that led to about eight and a half fold increase in the universe of known driver variants in the context of Parkinson's and, and with ancillary information about Gaucher's disease in addition to providing much deeper clarity into the functional drivers and their associated mechanisms causing disease. So this is a graphical representation of that yield. Just to orient everybody, this is known as a swarm plot, uh, where each dot represents a variant from an article or many articles, and always brought back to a patient or several patients who were initially found to have those variants. And so there's a great deal of evidence uh, belying this simplified plot, but you can nevertheless see at a high level, some patterns emerge where there's more information, more prevalence of, of variant pre uh, presence along the linear axis of that protein, uh, subjacent to these functional domains in the GBA gene. So these, these plots are known as swarm plots and their waviness is just so that you can see where the pattern emerged. But if you drop parallels to the x-axis from any one of those dots, that will reflect the position on the protein of that particular variant. The way that they snake up is just a reflection of where they're starting to aggregate. So you can see many aggregations toward the right-hand side of this lysosomal acid glycosyl cerebrosidase um, uh, domain of the GBA gene. And there's a great deal of obviously information and detail that I'm, I'm not discussing here, but suffice it to say that we, uh, we, in the production of this genomic landscape, evinced a great deal of these patterns with all of their associated detailed evidence supporting the, the, the presence of those patterns. So that's the, the functional aspect that I just wanted to lightly touch on. One of the more interesting things about uh, the work that we did for this gene was uh, the second uh, aspect that the group was interested in, which was to say, how does GBA mutation subspeciate different patient populations within Parkinson's patients and within Gaucher's, and in particular within patients who have Gaucher's with different subtypes? The type one is the one that has a neuro, uh, neurological affinity and a, a prevalence or predilection for um, relatedness to Parkinson's disease. And what I'm laying out here in different colors or different tiers of the plot are along the right side spine of the graph are the different diseases with their associated swarm plots so that you can, looking at the two bottom plots there, the gray and the dark blue, you can see which variants are related to Gaucher's and, and Parkinson's uh, generally. But then looking at the orange, light blue, and, and uh, medium blue plots there for Gaucher's type 1, type 2, and type 3, you can start to see how patterns emerge in the presence of these different variants across the GBA gene that specifically target type 1 Gaucher's, but don't target types 2 and type 3. So again, without giving away the ghost and getting into any detail, there's detailed information that our genomic landscape has unlocked 
that's provided some insight into why that might be and how it has bearing on the protein coding consequence of the GBA target that this group is designing a molecule to, to treat. So shifting gears to the second use case, still within Parkinson's, this is the LARC2 gene, which is a large multi-domain and multifunctional protein that has uh, both GTPase and kinase activity, which was uh, obviously lent itself to um, some heterogeneity in its targetability, which was what this other group was interested in helping divine in the context of Parkinson's disease. And so we undertook to produce a comprehensive genomic landscape, not simply to take their universe of known variants from 13 to 150, again, pathogenic, clinical grade, evidence-backed pathogenic variants, leading to about a tenfold enrichment of their resolution of the universe of LARC2 variants that cause Parkinson's, but fully a hundred of those pathogenic variants had associated in vitro and or in vivo functional evidence that allowed us to better clarify what those variants were doing in the context of LARC2 protein function. So again, the, the gray there is the previous universe and the dark blue there at the bottom is the swarm plot for the, the new high resolution comprehensive universe of LARC2 variants in the context of Parkinson's disease. There, again, each, each dot is a variant. Uh, when you drop a perpendicular, that's where in the protein those variants are, are present. And they're, they're presented here along the, the protein domain structure so that you can see how the variants are clustering and how they're likely to be leading to protein coding consequence. So I'll leave this slide up here while I um, um, uh, clarify that if you just had the benefit of the, the 13 variants that was the baseline level of understanding of what was going on in this protein, no pattern would emerge. Whereas when you benefit from a comprehensive and exhaustive view, you can see some pretty salient patterns that emerge, many of them that are perhaps not surprisingly focused on the two GTPAs and kinase domains, but also some ancillary patterns emerge, such as variant peaks in the armadillo domain, a cluster of variants in the anchorin domain, as well as in the WD40 domain that were not present at all based on the previous research that was undertaken. So a, a clear demonstration of the benefit of having a comprehensive understanding of all of the genetic drivers backed by evidence that are leading to disease in this one protein. And again, without going into too much detail, I'm happy to, to have a, a private conversation with any of the attendees who are particularly interested, but in addition um, to broadening the universe of understanding of causative variants, we clarified the nature of those protein coding consequences where there were empirical studies to support any of those conclusions. So in addition to being multifunctional based on those multiple domains, LARC2 is interesting in that it both can connote when very varied, uh, sorry, when, when mutated, when uh, uh, variants uh, lead to disease, can be uh, causative of disease through either a gain of function or a loss of function mechanism. And so in our process of putting together this comprehensive genomic landscape, our curation uh, team was specifically looking for and annotating those variants from studies that clarified that the protein led, uh, uh, when mutated, led to a gain of function of LARC2 or a loss of function, and which function was affected. On the top there, I think, is the GTPase, and on the bottom is the kinase. So again, you're starting to see some interesting patterns emerge, some of which may be surprising uh, or, or may not, depending on how much you knew beforehand and how much detail you had about any of those previously known variants. So the latter two examples that I want to go through uh, are on two separate diseases. Uh, the, the next disease that I'm going to touch on is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, better known as ALS. And ALS is caused by a number of different genes. TARD-BP is one of them and the one that I'd like to focus on. But ALS is properly defined, given its prevalence in the United States of less than 200,000, as a rare disease, but obviously leads to 
to neurodegenerative uh, phenotypes in patients, uh, including a progressive loss of motor control and eventually uh, uh, death due to respiratory failure. Uh, it also has as a, a, a relatively common sequelae of the various ways that uh, the genetics can lead to this phenotype, the aggregation of these TARD-BP uh, protein moieties. Um, there are some treatments uh, that have been brought to bear for ALS, but they only slow progression. And so there's a great deal of interest in uh, a more curative and in more impactful treatments. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's a great deal of different types of genetic paths that lead to this ALS phenotype. FUS and SOD1 and TARD-BP are among the most common. And TARD-BP is the, the focus of this study, although obviously we have information about the other uh, gene targets as well. So TARD-BP is a nucleic acid binding protein that's involved in, in regular regulation of transcription and various other RNA uh, processing and stability activities. In ALS, those aggregates of TARD-BP are common, and, and functional studies involving TARD-BP will often find mislocation or abnormal fragmentation by protease in those functional assays, as well as a, a, a whole panoply of other uh, um, heterogeneous mechanisms of disease causation at the protein level, which is why the, the, the work that we did here was targeted on disambiguating uh, those different heterogeneous protein consequences and reconciling what those consequences look like along the, the, the uh, axis of the functional domains of TARD-BP protein itself. So just to highlight um, that the known universe of TARBP pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in, in ClinVar, which is a common go-to uh, for pharma and clinical users alike, pales in comparison to the full scope and breadth of understanding that uh, a genomic landscape from, from Genomenon can provide, namely uh, a five-fold increase in known variants, many of which, in this case, I think most of which have associated functional evidence hiding away in the decades of genetic uh, and basic science research about this protein that only our um, uh, computational intelligence followed by expert curation approach to developing these comprehensive landscapes can bring to bear. So again, the swarm plot for TARD-BP along the axis of, of the functional domains of that protein, you can see some clear patterns emerge where there's a, a, a focus of, of variance in the domain that's responsible for interaction with the uh, ubiquitin 2 protein. There's, uh, there's the suggestion here to me, when I, when I look at this landscape, as I have looked at many dozens of these different landscapes, that there may be a three-dimensional confirmation within that domain where the more prevalent and, and well characterized through experimental study uh, variance seem to be um, uh, converging in three-dimensional space. The other thing to note here is that many of those variants, uh, I think most of them, and in fact, none of the variants in that uh, uh, ubiquitin 2 interactive domain are nonsense or frame shift. They're all missense variants. And the fact that they're clustering in such a distinct way not just in that blue domain, but in addition to the nuclear export signal, as you can see above the, the gray bar there, and in some of the other domains, the RRM domains, one and two, which also seem to suggest there's a, a three-dimensional confirmation. The fact that they're clustering in such a distinct way, and the fact that they're uh, almost exclusively missense mutations, suggests to me strongly that there's a gain of function mechanism and in fact, when you look into the details, as what we obviously did to produce this, uh, the vast majority of the studies for these variants corroborate a gain of function mechanism of action. And only when you've aggregated all of that information into this comprehensive landscape does the full uh, uh, complexion of the, the consequence of mutations in this protein become clear. So the last example that I want to talk about is a slightly different disease that also leads uh, to neurodegenerative symptoms. That's Wilson disease caused by mutations in the ATP7B protein. It is a rare disease. 
uh, much rarer than the other diseases that I talked about, affecting uh, uh, two to 3,000 individuals in the United States. It is the result of abnormal accumulations of copper in liver and, and brain tissue, leading to involuntary movements and, and psychiatric symptoms, as well as obviously uh, long-term damage to those sensitive regions. There's therapies associated with uh, treatment of Wilson's disease, but there's also very active studies looking to develop more uh, effective therapies. And uh, the engagement here was to produce a comprehensive genomic landscape that would better uncover, again, the full breadth of mutation in Wilson disease at the hands of this gene, as well as better clarifying what those different mutations are doing um, at the protein level. So uh, additionally, uh, as a comparator here, we have ClinVar, which has 250 some known pathogenic variants associated with ATP7B. And even in a well-studied gene like ATP7B, Mastermind's uh, uh, ability to produce a comprehensive genomic landscape led to a nearly threefold increase in the number of pathogenic variants. And among those pathogenic variants brought clarity to the functional studies and their consequence for 150 of those variants. And again, these uh, uh, are arrayed in the ATP7B protein against their functional domains. Just crudely, on the left are the, the metallic binding domains, one through six. And on the right, crudely, are the ATPase domains, the effector domains of the ATP7B protein. This landscape, to me, suggests a loss of function mechanism, given how distributed the mutations are. Uh, and indeed, when you look into the details of, of all of the assembled evidence, the, re the empirical studies do demonstrate that this is a loss of function mechanism. But nevertheless, there are still some interesting patterns that emerge, two that are salient. One at the far left is that snake of mutations that seem to concentrate in one of those uh, metallic binding domains there, all of which are missense, uh, suggesting that there may be a critical portion of that one me me metallic binding domain. Again, the details um, are all patterned in the, the comprehensive genomic landscape. And then the other is in between the, the uh, dark blue and the orange domains there are the, the seeming concentration of variants in ATP7B in a region that doesn't have a functional domain, or at least not a well-characterized functional domain. Again, the details of which uh, emerge when you examine those through hypothesis generation and testing of the comprehensive genomic landscape. So I don't have time to, to speak to it, but I, I appreciate that many on the call who are interested in neurodegenerative disease are particularly interested in Alzheimer disease. I don't want to um, um, leave you with the impression that uh, the three diseases that I talked about are the only diseases within neurodegenerative disease for which we have data. And indeed, we have information about uh, the APP in presenilins 1 and 2 genes, as well as the disease risk alleles uh, in APOE, uh, covering the Alzheimer's disease genomic landscape. I just won't showcase any of that information here. Um, but suffice it to say that the value provided from this Alzheimer's focused comprehensive genomic landscape is similar to the value that's provided in the context of those other diseases. So in, in some, the benefits of these genomic landscapes can be broken down, at least for neurodegenerative disease, into two rough camps, providing insight into the mechanism of action, as I described, which, which can be uh, utilized in, in improving target identification. I, I top-lined it here to say that novel insight into five to ten more functional drivers can, can result from engagement with Genomenon to produce a genomic landscape for your target of interest. Both gain of function and loss of function mechanisms can be elucidated, and this altogether can lead to more focused R&D efforts so that you don't waste time and resources on candidate compounds and targets for which there's less supporting genetic evidence. And then the other side of that, the, the value prop, is in increasing diagnostic yield, better defining a more comprehensive market, better defining how to initially segregate patients 
into patients who are likely based on evidence to respond to your therapy before beginning your clinical trial or after in a post hoc analysis, better clarifying the results of your clinical trial patterned on the genetic and genomic evidence that a, a comprehensive genomic landscape can provide. And I say there in that the sub bullet point that there in, in some of these um, work that we've done with pharma partners, we've increased the number of, of genetic biomarkers that they understood when they first engaged with us in at least one circumstance by 50 fold. So uh, depending on how well characterized your gene is or how much effort you've expended, in every circumstance, the, the production of a comprehensive genomic landscape can dramatically increase your result, but sometimes to an almost unbelievable extent, especially if the genes are less well characterized or the disease mechanisms are just being worked out. And then lastly, and, and what I alluded to at the beginning, um, producing a, a comprehensive genomic landscape is useful in the promulgation of a companion diagnostic, where not only can we increase the diagnostic yield uh, in, in the one example that I didn't showcase in a different disease by threefold in the number of genetic biomarkers, but also in expediting and maximizing the likelihood of an initial approval when uh, documents are submitted to the FDA. So I'll circle back to that, uh, the top line message that I wanted to convey that understanding the genetics that support the candidacy of your targets and the, the disease pathogenesis of your, your targeted disease can double the success rate of a clinically viable drug that can be brought to market. And Genomenon is uniquely suited to um, solve that challenge uh, in concert with our pharma clients. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Kate for any questions that have come in during my, my presentation or otherwise that are coming in live now um, um, from the attendees. Great, thank you so much, Mark, for this presentation. Uh, we did have some questions come in. Uh, first one, for missense mutations, how are these being reported out in the clinical report? Uh, example, TARDPP. Uh, uh, so there's a couple of ways that I can imagine that, that question being answered. Uh, a, a technical way to, to answer that would be in the variant nomenclature. So uh, given that this is a highly technical process up front, the, the variant nomenclature can be modified to fit any downstream needs that the client that we're working with has so that the data that we produce doesn't need to be transformed in any way, but can be immediately actionable and intercalated into the downstream workflow. So that's one way, the, the standard way that we, we produce the variant nomenclature is according to uh, industry standard HGVS nomenclature. But we're, we're flexible and able to modify the nomenclature as befits any given solution. The other way to answer that question would be, how do you particularly deal with missense variants, which by their nature don't necessarily lend themselves to a clear understanding of what they're doing to protein coding consequence. And so I'll fall back on, on my, um, uh, the slide where I discussed the comprehensive genomic landscapes production is that we use the ACMG and AMP criteria and assemble the clinical and functional evidence necessary to properly interpret the pathogenicity of variants, whether they're nonsense or frame shift or deletion mutations or point mutations that lead to uh, protein coding consequence, such as missense variants, or otherwise um, non-coding variants like splice or even intronic variants. So we follow the industry standard approach to interpreting all of those different types of variants. And if you have a particular question about TARDBP, I'm happy to have a private conversation. Great, thanks, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, can you suggest genetic biomarkers, also including mRNA? based on a drug used and in target indication? This is a, a great question. So um, it, it allows me to clarify two things. I've, I've been focusing here on the genetic variants and their protein coding consequence. But uh, in, in the 
uh, armamentarium of Genomenon to produce these data sets, we can also take a step back and assess information at the gene level. And that necessitates looking at the different mechanisms of disease causation at the hand of the different genes. And that includes differential expression. So if you're talking about differential expression of different genes and how the, those differential expressions can lead to disease, that is something that can be produced in a comprehensive genomic, genomic landscape at a gene level. Yes. Um, the, the other thing to say, to build on that, is that where I answered the first question by saying that we follow industry standard guidelines for interpretation of variants, ACMG or AMP, as well as genes. In the case of constitutional disease, that would be the ClinGen guidelines as a standard framework. Nevertheless, we layer on top of that curation and annotation any custom insight that the client is particularly interested in. So I didn't go into too much detail but hopefully in those examples that I showcased, there were particular points of interest for the clients that they were specifically looking for based on their previous research and their, their pre-existing knowledge of the, the gene and the disease. Things such as the clinical frameworks used to assess severity of disease. That is a curative activity and annotation that we can provide in the production of genomic landscapes. Another Another example would be uh, assembling a patient-specific laboratory value database. If the disease is, is such that there are clinical laboratory biomarkers that allow you to track the development and severity of disease, we have had engagements where we've produced such a database by exhaustively curating all such case studies and case series that report out on those, those studies. A final example to, to, uh, to um, to um, really drive home the fact that we can do custom curation is in exhaustively reviewing all of the literature for a given disease to pull out prevalence studies as the prevalence of different variants and different genes are found in different subpopulations of disease based on ethnicity or based on disease subtypes. So in conversation with the client, it really depends on what the focus is and what the nature of the disease or the gene or the, the gene pathway is as to what custom annotations we layer on top of those standard frameworks. Here's a good question. Um, what about new papers? Uh, how can we be sure that, that the data is up to date? That is a great question. So. Um, Particularly in the in the context of neurodegenerative disease, research is is expanding exponentially. Um, I, I mentioned the the commoditization of genomic sequencing and how much more straightforward it is to to perform these sequencing studies on a large scale. Research is not slowing; it's only getting faster, and all of that information becomes less and less tractable to extract and understand manually. And we appreciate that. And so with all of these genomic landscapes that I've described, um, the, the work is evergreen and continually updated, both for previously curated variants for which there's new papers about those variants, that is updated, in addition to any new variants that weren't previously described that are newly published in any one of those papers that come out uh, from quarter to quarter. So the data in these genomic landscapes is kept up to date and uh, the curation component is preserved across those updates so that you're assured a, a sensitive, comprehensive, and highly valuable up-to-date data set. Great, thank you. Another question. In the example of ATP7B, how many of the 145 variants with functional evidence were in the 248 ClinVar reported variants? And you might have to go back to that slide if you can't. Um. I think it's here. The, the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember that exactly. I do know, though, that we did look at that quite um, specifically. I just don't know the result. I will say, though, that most of the ClinVar variants, 
do not have reference citations and and even if they do they do not have a characterization of the those functional studies so i don't just want um the the audience members to perseverate on the sh the number of variants that are accumulated which is uniformly more and in most cases much more than is available in clinvar genomenon's uh comprehensive genomic landscapes can double or multiply by 10 the number of variants that are seen in clinvar but beyond that sheer number there's exhaustive annotation of all of those variants as well clarity which is not provided by any of the references or information in clinvar at all so that was a good question i'd be happy to, to reach back out to that individual with a specific answer though great thank you a question from claire is what do you think of the cases with not much known genetics related to diseases do you think your platform or genetic biomarkers would still help target id patient stratification for such cases that is a great question. So um, I'll say that Genomenon's data is at heart an association database. So where a lot of the focus of my talk and certainly of our, our software in, in the hands of uh, clinical users is on variant information for known disease entities and clarity on published evidence for a given variant to make clinical grade calls or to support some of the activities in pharma that I described. But a necessary preamble to assembling any of that data in Mastermind is an understanding of all of these associations at multiple levels. So I'll say, uh, uh, to answer your question directly, is if it exists in the literature, directly or indirectly, no matter how rare, if there's one reference that talks about this association, we have it, we understand it, and we have tools that can automate the assembly of that information, followed by efficient and, and custom targeted review of that information. As a specific example, one group that we're working with doesn't know how their drug works. They know that it works, and they know that it's extremely safe but they don't know how it works and they don't know because it's not directly published in a uh, in a single reference and the the work that we're engaged in with them is in unweaving that understanding from disparate publications that have information that touch on what the mechanism may be but where the the specific mechanism of action of their drug will only become clear with a comprehensive view of all of those pieces of evidence brought together and assessed through the production of a, a comprehensive genomic landscape. So that's a, a fairly long-winded uh, way to say yes, we have that information, and I would welcome a, a private conversation with the, the questioner to, to really understand what they're looking for and the ways that um, Genomenon can, can help. And this leads to um, a related question is, what about looking at gene by gene interactions? Yes, so um, uh, the gene level information that we have comes along with it, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Mastermind being an association database, gene gene associations. So gene gene networks at the protein level, the protein interactome, the pathway participants, if they're not directly interacting with each other, but participate uh, in a common pathway, uh, how proteins may affect the expression of other genes, all of that information is latent in our association database and can be uncovered simply by asking the question in conversation with the client. And as I said, in patterning the things that we're looking to uncover when we organize and, and, and manually um, curate all of that information. And so I think with that, what what is that data look like then? How is it delivered? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, 
I have a, a slide that I, I'm loath to put in the main presentation because it's pretty busy. Um, but I, I want to clarify that this data is fully downloadable and, and um, integratable into your systems downstream. And the format is modifiable so that it can fit any one of those um, uh, downstream use cases. This is an example of one of the genes that I, one of the proteins that I talked about for Parkinson's, the GBA gene. Each row represents one of those dots or one of those variants. Each column is a specific datum or piece of information where I want to emphasize that we have a very tiered approach to presenting this evidence where one of those columns you may see in the middle there is the provisional call. So it's the top line information from our curation so that you can start to sort and analyze at a high level what this information means. And that is the provisional ACMG call where you can see here their pathogenic variants. Then the next columns over are the number of articles that we investigated technically and manually to come to that conclusion. So in, in many cases, it's many hundreds of papers that we looked at. And then a further level of, of um, a summarization of the evidence is which of those variants have functional studies. In, in this case for ACMG, it's PS3 category of evidence. Which of those variants have clinical grade evidence? In, in one example, it would be PS4 or strong evidence of pathogenicity because that variant segregates with disease in a number of different patients, as well as the population frequency data and um, uh, the uh, in silico predictive models. And then a further tier of evidence is if you want to drill down into the specific information from any one of those assertions, categorized and then top-lined, you can see the reference from which those assertions came within their, their category of evidence. In the case that I described, functional studies over at the far right, and in the middle bottom, the clinical studies, with their PMID indicated references, and a, a sentence cue, a quote from the, the author, that makes the case for each of those different assertions. Followed by, um, on the left, any of the, the custom annotations that were requested, be they specific assays that were used in the functional studies, other biomarkers that are associated with uh, the protein consequence, different diseases where that variant is mentioned in, in that context, or different ethnicities, or, or really anything that's of interest to the, the group that we're talking to based on their needs and based on the disease. In addition to any of those um, baseline uh, data points such as population frequency at the upper right there or the different ways that the variant is described in, in the, the literature or the SIFT and, and polyphen type of uh, in silico predictive models. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you everyone for your questions. We certainly appreciate everyone who reached out. If you enjoyed today's webinar, uh, make sure you register for next month's Lab Roots Genetics Virtual Week. Uh, that starts on April 21st through the 23rd. Mark uh, will be presenting genomic landscapes, leveraging genetic evidence throughout the pharma pipeline. And the presentation for this Lab Roots event will explore more specific use cases across a broader breadth of disease, including rare disease and cancer. And we can send more details to that in uh, the follow-up email. For any other questions that you may have, you can always reach out to us at hello at genomenon.com. For more information about our solutions for pharma, please visit genomenon.com slash pharma. And also, your feedback is important to us, so please take a moment to answer the short survey at the conclusion of this webinar session. The recording and Q&A from today's webinar event will be emailed to you shortly. And again, we thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to staying in touch. Take care.